Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. He will do just what he said. Let's bow our head. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your power, your spirit, your Holy Ghost. Thank you for your word. You, God, will cure us from our diseases. You will heal us from our diseases, from our diseases. You are a mighty God. Touch us today, save you, and deliver us, set free, bring marriages together. Heal this sin in the name of Jesus. And do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Say it, say it.
there was such a man that lived and that he was put to death by crucifixion. Where's the miracle I spoke of? Well, consider this. Let your imagination translate the story into your own time. Well, Possibly your own home or your own town. Yeah. A young man who father is a carpenter, grows up working with the fathers in the shop. One day he put his tools down and, 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 and began to walk out his father's shop. Uh -huh. He began to preach on street corners and nearby countryside. Walking from place to place, preaching all the while, even though he wasn't an ordained minister, he does this for three years. Well, then he is arrested, tried, and convicted. Uh, There's no one court, there was only one court of here, appeal, so he was executed at the age of 33. Well, <laughs> along with two common thieves. Those in charge of his execution roll dice to see who gets his clothing. The only possessions he had, his family, his family could not afford a proper burial for him, so he was entombed in a tomb that was bought. End of story? That's a rhetorical statement. Yeah. But yet it's a question. Woo. No, this uneducated, poverty less young man who left no written word has for 2,000 years had a greater effect on the world than all the rulers, kings, emperors, and all conquerors, generals of admirals, all the scholars, the scientists, philosophers who have ever lived, all of them put together, he had more effect on them. Yeah. How do you explain that unless he really was who he said he was? Yeah. I remember some time ago my wife and I had a good experience, probably one of the most greatest experiences of my life. I didn't know at the time I, I, I was doing the work of the Lord, but I didn't understand that this, may, this experience may impact me the way it did. Some time ago when we were stationed in Germany years ago, uh, we developed some ministry team. And in our ministry teams, we were, we were witnesses in we were witness in the refugee camp. Yeah. And those people that were displaced, and those people that was a product of their environment unwillingness, so they had to leave their country. Just because a person doesn't have what you have doesn't mean they're not capable of getting it. Yeah. It means that their environment was such that they had to get out and they had to start all over. I've learned not to condemn a person, not to judge a person for what they have. Because what they have, amen, they're probably grateful for what they have. And what you have, you're probably struggling with to keep it. But there were unwillingly, there was an, an, an unwillingly, unwilling specimen in such, for lack of a word, a petri dish. Being in a place where they could not function and they could not serve the Lord, so they were put into exile and they had to leave. And so we had this opportunity, amen, to witness to them. I remember walking up to this, this young man who was of African descent. I remember we had Iranians, we have Iraqis, and other people that were in this camp, coming from, and Turkish coming from different countries and and, and I just happened to knock on a man a door, and at some place they only had tents. And I knocked on the person's door, and I said, I want to tell you about Jesus. And then when he, when he, when, when he looked at me, and he looked at me, he said, he said, what about him? And, 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 and I always had myself prepared. I, I studied. They gave us these tracks to hand out and say, when a person talked to you about Jesus and when you witness him about Jesus, these are the things he should say. He should take him down the Roman road of salvation. And it was like step by step. But they never told me when he asked me what about him. What should I respond with when they said, what about the person that you were talking to? Then I, I wasn't prepared for that, even though I was saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues and the Spirit of God could be otherwise, because he asked such a question that challenged my identity. Now you say, well, how did it challenge your identity? What? I knew what the Bible said about Jesus. I knew who everybody else said about Jesus and who he was, Amen. but I, I had to develop 
some type of identity of who he is to me within myself. And so when he asked me that question, he was really asking me about my identity. When he said, what about Jesus? He would say, why are you so, why are you so driven to tell me about a man that I've never heard about before? Tell me what makes you come knock on my door and tell me about this man that I never, I haven't even seen a Bible. My religion, my religion is something else. I have a conviction of another religion and you're going to knock on my door and tell me about someone that I don't even know. What drives you to do this? I recognized that when I was sharing with him about Jesus, it really wasn't too much about him at the moment. It was about my identity, who I see that he is to me and how I felt about him. If Jesus asked the disciples after he said, on the way to a place, that means they were walking and not necessarily sitting down like you did, but on the way to a place, he asked his disciples, who the men say? that I am. And some of them, amen, began to call him different names. I, I think it was to arouse or, or get their attention because he was getting better to hit them with the big question. There are many people that can tell you who Jesus is, but those people that are telling you who Jesus is may not be telling you who Jesus is to you. They may say, I've heard of him. There are many people, if you ask him on the street who Jesus is, they'll tell him, well, he was some great man or he was a good person or he was some scheme or, or fabrication that the Christian world had, you know, had fabricated. They'll, have, they'll tell you, well, he was just like Buddha or some other person. But then they'll give you all the kinds of excuses in the Gallup poll. And then they'll say, there's so many people have so many interpretations who Jesus really is. And I've learned if I was studying that thing, this is an attack on my identity. And so, amen, I get to the point where Jesus said, he turned it around and said, amen, even though some say that you were Elijah, amen, some say, amen, you were Jeremiah, and then some say that you were a prophet, and there even in the, the Pharisees in the Bible called him Bezabon. Yeah, say. But I realized, amen, that when he asked me this question, I mean, I couldn't give him the Roman roads to salvation because <laughs> he didn't know who. Amen, to have salvation in. Yeah. I couldn't, amen, break it down for John 3 and 16 just at the moment because he was challenging me because he really wasn't asking me, amen, who this man was. He said, why are you knocking on my door telling him about someone I don't know? And so he was really challenging who I am in the Lord. I found out that who I am is a sum total of who I know. Yeah. And, the son, and so you begin to act out the characteristics of the person of, of who you know, because who you know you become. And so at that very moment, I had to stand up, I had to rear up and say, oh, 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 he's challenging who I am, who I believe in, who I love, and who I serve, who I'm seeking. I mean, he's challenging my identity. He's not necessarily challenging me because of Jesus. When you heard that, you said, man, that's an insult for him to say, who is this man that you're talking about? To you, that's an insult, but to others, they don't know. Paul said to some people, and then we're the Bible to them. The Bible said, we're living the visible red of men. People look at us and when they see us, they see Christ on the inside of us. They read us like a Bible. And when they see you and when you're not acting right, and then you're preposterous. And then you, you understand what I'm saying? You're not doing, you're not, you're not being, you're not using your identity. And then Satan will steal your identity. He will sabotage you. I uh, read an article in the, in the internet where, amen, they say that people were saying, I don't know who I am. And I don't know why I exist here on this earth. And they were talking about to the point they committed suicide. And then another person said, you know what, I cannot figure why I was born into the earth. They were having an identity problem. And sometimes when you have an identity problem, it doesn't mean there's something that's a disorder. It just means that you're dealing with so many issues that you cannot, amen, you cannot differentiate between what's the Lord and what's not God. Let me get back to the story. And so that he challenged me and that changed my life. I can't give him just a Roman road of salvation. I just can't give him Mark 11, 22. I just can't give him all of these scriptures unless I can share with him the conviction that's on the inside of me. There are people that deal with identity theft that, that will steal your identity. This is when identity you want them to steal. 
And so you wanted, and I wanted him to pick up my identity because my identity represented Christ. How many of you have begun to talk to someone about Jesus but, but become stagnated or embarrassed or ashamed to tell the person who he is to you? When it becomes personal, it, it's really the personal relationship that causes a person to be saved. It's really the personal relationship with Jesus that causes your faith to be increased. The Bible said, now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the more word of God that you hear, Romans 10 and 17, amen, said, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The more word of God that you hear, the stronger you become, and the more personal Christ is to you. And so he attacked my identity. And there are many people that are attacking our identity every day. I mean, when we go to work at the various places and we meet different people, I mean, they attack our identity. And we have to, we have to, we have to make a choice whether or not, amen, to stand up for Christ and to stand up for who we believe or to take on their identity. And at that very moment in our realm, my spirit realm up on the inside of me and I said, the Lord said, you got to get it together, son. He's not hearing about Jesus. He won't know it. He's not wanting to hear about Jesus right now. He want to hear why you knocking on his door, telling about somebody that you haven't heard of. And then in the Bible, the Lord spoke to me, and I began to witness to him, and I began to tell him and to testify how good God has been to me. And I had always been saved. I had always served the Lord. I hadn't always prayed. I hadn't always fasted. But I began to tell him how good, how God healed me, how it brought me out of darkness into his marvelous life. How he touched me. Nobody else could touch me. And, then, and when I was weeping one night, I, I began to tell him how God picked me up and turned me around. And, and I was weeping one night, and the morning came. I began to praise the Lord and I give God the glory. And that captured his attention. And so he said, No, okay, you can take me in. He said, I'll take you in my house. And then he, he set a piece of bread on the table. And, amen. And then. And I looked at the bread, you know what I'm saying? But I had to remember they didn't have what he had. What he had was a precious thing to him. And so I cut a piece of bread and I ate it. And I gave faith and I began to witness to him. And amen. And I believe those people turned their life over to the Lord. As a result, amen, we had people of all races and all nationalities coming to our church because, amen, we didn't see them, amen, for who their environment is. Are you with me now? I mean, some of you are raised up in environments, amen. You didn't want to be in there because, but your environment made your identity. And you said, you know what? I mean, when I grow up, I want to be able to get out of this environment. Some of you woke up in an alcohol environment, a drug infested environment. Some of you woke up with a fighting and, 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 and struggling environment. And you said to yourself, this is not who I am. I'm an unwilling vessel in this place. I got to get out of here because I do not want my identity to be defined by where I am. change your identity. The first thing you got to do to change your identity, you got to go to the police department. You got to tell them the reason why you want to change your identity. And then because you had to be under such great danger, I want you to guess this. And I had to recognize that if I didn't, I mean, you're with the Lord, I'm going to be in a danger of damnation. And I'm not going to make it to heaven like people say. And so I, it was in danger. So I had to turn around. I had to change my name from Larry, I mean, to Shane. Are you with me now? I mean, from Stealer. Are you with me now? From a person that steals, from a person that didn't do the things of the Lord. I had to change my identity. Somebody, amen, to serve the Lord. So when they, when I walked down the street, they didn't see the old Larry, the hard headed fella. And man, they didn't always do things right. They stood on the corner. They fought everybody. They got to live by the business. But now when I walk down the street, they say, man, that's not like that. You know it. And man, but now he's a child of God. He's a, he's, he's a child. He served God. Then the next thing they say, I mean, in order for you to change your social security number, and man, you got to convince the social security department, and man, that your social security had to be changed because, and man, you were in danger. Yeah. I changed my social security number to John 3 and 16. Are you with me now? For God so loved the world that he gave that he only begotten son that whomsoever believed in him, and man, what, 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 shall not perish but have everlasting life. And say, after you change your social security number, you got to change your residence. Or you, you can't stay in the old place. You got to get out of that drug infested area. You got to get around those people that go to the club and, and not serving the Lord. You got to get away from those negative people. You got to change your residency. I mean, wherever you live, you can't live there anymore. And then pray to the name of the Lord. And so, the Bible, and so this is what I did in order to change my residence. The Bible said, amen. The Romans, the Romans said, if you confess, the Lord Jesus and believe your heart. I mean, I had to change how I believe. My heart can no longer reside in the place.
place and then where I was now spiritually. I had to change my heart and how, amen, how I felt. And if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, the Lord Jesus the God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I had to change my own identity and I could not be the way, amen, I used to be. Then they turn around and the next thing you do, after you, amen, after you change, amen, your name, after you change, your social security number, after you change, amen, your residency, amen, now you got to do it in such a way that people can't find you. The Bible says take off that old man and put on that new man. They can find the old man, but this new man you can't track because my social security number has been changed. John 3, 16, amen, my residency has been changed because now I Savior. 
Romans 15 and 7. I have been called a saint, yes. not a sinner anymore. Colossians 1 and 2. Philippians 1 and 1. For Philippians 1 and 2. Amen. You're going to have to get the tape. Amen. <laughs> Amen. For this reason, I serve God. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who yes. dwells in me. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. I tell you who I am. I know who Jesus is, but now you're challenging my identity. I mean, God leads me in, tri in triumph and the knowledge of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14. The hardening of my mind has been removed. Now I serve the Lord. I'm not a sinner anymore. 2 Corinthians 3 and 14. I am a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. When you see me in the workplace, when you see me in the commissary, when you see me in Walmart, you know the place you frequently live. When you see me at the mall, you know you shouldn't be in mall, you shouldn't be in church, but you in And when you see me there, when you see me in those places, amen, amen, I'm the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. I have been made one with all who are in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 and 28. I am no longer a slave, but a child of Christ. Amen. Galatians 4 and 7. I have set free by Christ, Galatians 5 and 1. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Ephesians 1 and 3 says, Amen. I have been blessed with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He said, I am chosen, holy, holy, and holy and blameless before God. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Ephesians 1 and 3. I am redeemed and forgiven by the grace of Christ. Ephesians 1 and 7. I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff. Amen. But it's about our identity. It's who we really are in Christ. Amen. Ephesians 1 and 11 says, I've been predestinated by God to obtain inheritance. Amen. I have been sealed with the Holy Ghost and His promises. Ephesians 1 and 13. Because God's mercy I love, I have been made alive in Christ. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 and 6. I am God. I am God's workmanship, created to produce good works. Ephesians 2 and 10. I've been born, amen, near the I have been bought with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Ephesians 2 and 13. I am a member of Christ's body and particularly his promises. Yes. Ephesians 5 and 30. Yes. I have the boldness and the confidence to access God through faith in Christ. I'm strong. Amen. Ephesians 3 and 12. Yes. Myself, I, my new self-righteous and holiness. I have a new self-righteous and new holiness. And then Ephesians 4 and 24. I was formerly in darkness. But now I'm in the light of the Lord. I have a new life. Amen. Ephesians 5 and 8. I'm a citizen of heaven. Ephesians 3 and 20. Amen. The peace of God guards my heart and my mind. Philippians 4 and 7. God should supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Philippians 4 and 19. I have been made complete in Christ. Colossians 2 and 10. I have been raised up with Christ. Colossians 3 and 1. My life is hidden in Christ Jesus. In the Colossians 3 and 3. 3 and 3. Christ is my life and I will be revealed with his glory. Colossians 3 and 4. I have been chosen by God. I am holy and I belong to the Lord. Colossians 3 and 12. And then for God so loved the world that he gave it all to begotten Son. And then he chose me. And then he loved me. And then 1 Thessalonians 4. I know I give 
can't get a lot of scriptures today. Thank you, sir. But if you wrote it down and you did, get the tape. Play it over. Make that part of your confession. Yeah. If they challenge your identity, they're not necessarily challenging Christ. They're challenging how you feel about Him. Yeah. Please do.